Welcome to the Horror Writers Podcast. Join Jay Thorne and Richard Brown as they discuss writing and publishing horror using strategies that work for all genres. Hey everybody, welcome to the podcast, the newly branded, uh, newly created, co-hosted podcast. Uh, myself, Jay Thorne, and my new conspirator, Richard Brown, Richard Brown Books. Say hello there, Richard Brown. Hello, Jay. How are you? <laughs> He's got his horror writer podcast intro voice setting in uh, Google right now, so that's, uh, that's very helpful and convenient when you're doing a, a horror show. Uh, but before we get into it tonight, if you've been following me in the past uh, seven episodes of the podcast, you'll notice some changes. And I, I did a very short announcement via the podcast channel last week just to let people know, uh, especially people who had subscribed, so you can kind of know what to expect. Uh, but I, I just want to take a minute in the beginning here and kind of explain why this looks and sounds different than it did just a few weeks ago. So I prepared... It's because a, I'm here. Yeah, I prepared... A, uh, just a short little explanation I was hoping to get through. <laughs> wow, that's, yeah, that looks short. You got oh, like 24 I, hours? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had that prop all ready for like three days. I couldn't wait to break <laughs> that out. Now it's over. <laughs> <laughs> that, was the, that was the only joke you had for the whole show. That was it. Yeah, now it's, there's no joke. It's all downhill. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, you know, the, the truth is I, I started the podcast uh, – I called it the Horror Writers Podcast because I thought it could really, you could relate to people and, or writers or readers on different levels. So it could, you know, it could mean like the Horror Writers Podcast, meaning me the horror writer, or it could be four horror writers. Uh, there, you know, there are a number of ways you could take it. And I started off thinking like I wanted to give aspiring writers or new writers some of the groundwork for just the basic stuff that I kind of had to figure out by screwing up, up and not, you know, I didn't know any better. And so I thought, well, I could kind of pass that along. And, uh, and I, I did that, and I, and I started that way, and I s hit a certain point, um, probably, you know, four or five episodes in, and I started to realize, like, I, I don't know if I can sustain this, because, number one, there just wasn't a, a full episode or a lot on a lot of this little stuff, and secondly, doing it by yourself is hard. <laughs> Staring at a, you know, at a screen of yourself uh, and speaking with sort of no interplay <laughs> or conversation was challenging. And so, you know, Richard uh, reached out to me and uh, was, was very gracious. And he, he gave me some really, uh, I'm talking about you like you're not here. He gave me some really great. Just pretend I'm not here. <laughs> he gave me some great, like, honest feedback. And he, he asked me some questions that were, uh, that really forced me to think about what I was doing with it and why I was doing it. And, and it, honestly, he kind of made, you know, he forced me to, to bring my A game to kind of up a little bit. And he's, he said, you know what, if we're going to do this, you know, let's, let's do it right. Let's give it a good shot. And not that, not that I, what I was doing before wasn't necessarily right. It just, uh, it lacked sort of a sustainable energy. And so I just wanted to, you know, on air uh, and publicly thank you, Richard, for, um, <laughs> for, for coming to me and being honest and direct. I think that's, in all seriousness, I think that that's lacking in a lot of professional relationships. People are afraid to, to say what they really think, and, and that's not always a great policy. So I appreciate that. I was thrilled uh, when I asked Richard if he'd like to come on as you know, the full-time co-host, and he, he was all for it. And I mean, you've already, you can already see some of the great work he's done with the logo and the intro, and, uh, and he's, he just really kind of gave me a shot in the arm, and I appreciate it. You're making me blush. Yeah, but no one can see it behind your, your glasses. They can see Jack back there and Hitchcock. Beautiful. So that's that's all why? I got. That, that's why? that's basic the intro. You know. Why why are you lying to people though? About what? That's not how it went down. <laughs> all right, tell them how it really went down. <laughs> you came to me and you said my show's falling apart, <laughs> and and I was like, <laughs> and you said. Uh, yeah, I need you to come on and, and co-host the show. And uh, you, you remember, well, you know, you, you put out a number there, and I said, well, that's kind of low. And finally we settled on a, on a right number, and, and 
Hey, we we have an NDA. You're not supposed to be talking about this. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, you're paying me per episode. And <laughs> No, seriously, yeah, you know, it's doing a podcast has been something I wanted to do for for a while now. Even j- just a podcast on anything, really, just I thought it would be fun to do. And and when when I started hearing your show, it did seem like something was missing, and I couldn't believe you were doing it by yourself because it's just uh, that was something I was never going to do. I needed to have somebody else there, at least one other person to to kind of fire things back at, and. And yeah, I mean, we we did that one episode and everything seemed to, to click really well. And so now, I mean, we'll see what happens, but it, it's, I'm really excited about where we're going. Yeah, me too. And, and we've been pretty honest with each other as well and said that this really should be fun. I mean, we want it to be fun for listeners and viewers, fun for us. And if it's not fun, then we're not going to do it. But right now, uh, we're we're pretty energized by this and kind of excited to to bring it back. And, and I will say too that, you know, this is something that I've kind of done before, and um, my wife in particular uh, likes to point out how impulsive I am, and I just jump into stuff. But in all honesty, like, I didn't have the Horror Writers Podcast figured out. I didn't really know where I was going. I just got in the game. And sometimes you just have to get in the game. Uh, mm-hmm. and, and then, you know, it's, it's at least starting something. So I don't regret how it started, but I'm, I sure am glad that uh, – that you're here and we're kind of retooling this thing. No, I think it, you kind of got to expect that, that things at first are going to be a little rocky. I mean, when we both published our first book, I'm sure it was the same way. We didn't have all the answers. We've made so many mistakes and, you know, you just, you get better as you go and it's never going to be perfect. So. Right. Right. So, yeah. Cool. So you want to talk about uh, the, the topic for, for episode number eight? Well, first I was going to ask you just, you know, what's, what's new, what's going on what are you working on? All right. See, I already forgot. Cause I don't. I don't write shit down. So, uh, yeah. T- that's t- what t- I'm here for. <laughs> <laughs> He's got the clipboard because I was just like, oh yeah, that's right. That. Uh, uh, today's been pretty exciting. I I, I have to admit. Uh, s- today is September first, the day we're recording this, and I released the Black Fang Betrayal today. It's a collaboration uh, with myself and nine other authors, and it's a. Uh, it's a single novel, but it's it's uh, it's all one story, and uh, we got it out today. I, last I checked, I think it was at 2,700 paid. Um, the reviews are shooting up. It, the early the early feedback is really positive, so I'm just really pumped about it, and I can't wait to see what the rest of the week brings. Nice. So you got a. I also saw you you had a book pub ad coming up this month, don't you? Yes, uh, September nineteenth, I believe. I have a, a, a book bub ad for Hidden Evil Book One, Preda's Realm. Uh, it's going to be free in KDP Select for two days, and so I have a book bub ad. And then I built some other ad advertising around it. So I've got uh, a book sends. I've got a ENT ad, uh, book gorilla. I have probably seven or eight different ads lined up in those two days to really kind of hit it hard. So we'll see. So what, what is the what is the regular price? The regular price is two ninety nine. Oh, and you're going free for two days. I'm going free for two days, and I haven't I haven't done a free promotion in, in quite a while, so I'm kind of curious to see what the results are going to be. Is this uh have, have you got BookBub before? It's been a while. I've had uh, two to four BookBubs. Uh, they were mostly free. They were mostly over a year ago. Uh, BookBub has gotten <laughs> much more selective and competitive since then, and uh, I've been yeah. I've been turned down a number of times and on a number of books. So this one, when they accepted it, I was like, all right, I'm going to build a campaign around it because I don't know if I'm going to get it again. Mm-hmm. How about Definitely. you, man? What do you got going on? Uh, I actually have a new release too. Um, me and my wife did a like a collaboration on a kind of a short horror comic. Uh-huh. She does the drawing I do the writing um yeah it's a, it's just a short story that I wrote years ago and what's it called it's called knifed and I actually have it for pre-order right now because I wanted to try out the whole pre-order thing yeah so you know I don't expect to get a lot of pre-orders on it but but I just thought it would be cool to do that so the official release date is, is September 15th but so it'll be a, a week after this show airs um but yeah, it's it's an old short story that that she decided to to maybe to turn into a comic, and we we've tried to work together on on 
collaboratively like that before, but it's just, I'm usually kind of too, too nitpicky with her. So, so it just, so she kind of gives up on it and, and I don't really blame her, but this time I stayed out of her way. And so I guess since the story was already written, I didn't really have to do all that much. Okay. Uh, I did kind of edit a little bit, you know, once she was done, but, but yeah, it, it went really well and I'm really, really happy with it. So it's my first kind of graphic novel comic kind of thing. And I really would like to, to do more of that because, because I really like graphic novels a lot. Mm -hmm. Is it formatted for, for like a Kindle fixed layout or whatever it is that they have for like, yeah, a, yeah. I use the, yeah. the Kindle comic creator. Yeah. Okay. It's really easy to use. I mean, you just have to have the, the files the right size and then you just kind of upload them and it automatically creates it for you. And then you just go on KDP and, and do the, the same thing as you would for, for any other book. You just fill out the information and then you upload the Moby that the, the Kindle comic creator creates for you. Nice. Okay. And then, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, like, so did you, did you write did, or did you edit out the text on, on the images or did your wife read the story and then, and then write the text that's going on the images? Or did she do just the illustrations? She, no, she did everything at first. Okay. Uh, she took, I, I printed out the actual short story for her so mm -hmm. she could kind of, look at it, figure out what drawing she would need to make, go, you know, based on what's going on in the uh, story. Okay. And then she did all the drawings and then, you know, she laid out each page with the drawings and then she put the text on there. Mm -hmm. And I just went through and, you know, edited some of the text mm -hmm. that, you know, cause a short story is a little different than a comic. So I wanted to make it so it had more of a comic feel. Okay. And so I, I cut a few lines. I added a couple lines. It wasn't a lot really that I had to do, but but yeah, it was just a little bit of editing and it was basically my part. And then obviously I wrote the short story, but that was, that was already years ago that I did that. So mm -hmm. most of it's hers and, and she's pretty excited to, to have it out there now because it's her first thing, you know, that's published. So cool. hopefully, it, hopefully it doesn't sell like one copy and, but, but I don't, you know, I, I have no idea what to expect because I've never done the comic book thing before. I, and I'm guessing you and your wife are going to have a 50, 50 royalty split. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, it's only it's only 99 cents. So, you know how that that goes. It's not a lot of money anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Uh if I could if I could make it free, I mean, we might just do that just cuz it would be fun, but but I don't know about putting it on all those other places without cuz I and I don't have really comic creators for those, so right. I don't know how it would look and So I'm I just put it in select. I figured if nothing else, maybe I get some of the uh, borrows and then I can make you know, twice as much money just from the free borrow. Yeah. through Amazon, you know? Yeah, yeah, why not? That's cool, very cool. Yeah, other than that, I'm just, that, I'm still working on finishing uh, Dead Highways 3 and then uh, hopefully get that out in October. Mm -hmm. Looks like our box set's doing pretty good, so. It is. Uh, it's, although I, I have a feeling, uh, and I think Scott Nicholson confirmed this in, in some conversations, that Amazon has ratcheted down the algorithm on the multi-author boxes it seems like there's a ceiling now. Mm. So they're, they're, not, they're not cutting it off completely, but I would say if, if you're thinking about getting into that game now, um, you may have missed the boat on that tactic. <laughs> yeah, there's so. so many box sets now, too, that they might just be getting tired of them kind of flooding the, all the sales uh, rankings or whatever. Well, you know, I, I checked the list, and even, even back in like January, February, when End 1 came out, there were a number of multi-author box sets in the dystopian post-apoc sort of sub lists and you look there now and there's just there's just ours and i i think that's that's grit on our part we've, we've kind of hung in there but i think that's indicative of what like the way amazon has changed that algorithm and it's no longer favoring those the way it did uh i mean that's my hunch you know mm -hmm. we had we didn't have any advertising for end one uh we just went on our lists and we I think we got down to like 106 or 109 paid, and we threw a bunch of advertising at N3, and uh, we, we got like, what, five or 600, I think was mm -hmm. as low as we got. And, and I'm not complaining about that at all, but it's a, that's a big difference. So, and I, I have to assume it's got something to do with that algorithm. Now, I'm only in the, in the third set. Do you guys still do uh, like ads for the first two? No, we didn't do any ads for the first two at so all. So you never have? We didn't know. Um, in fact, it was when uh, Colin Barnes came on for N3. You know, he's, he 
is the guy that knows a lot about the advertising and, and getting velocity and how to sort of coordinate those ads in a way that you take advantage of that. And so when he came on, I told him, I'm like, you know, we really haven't done any advertising for these. If, if you want to sort of take that on and lead that, I'm sure everyone would chip in, you know, to, to out of royalties or whatever to pay that back. And so he's the one that organized all the ads for N3. Well, I mean, you got to wonder if they did change the algorithms that if we hadn't done the ads, it could really be further down. So maybe it's helped at least keep it where it's at. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and the other thing I think we have going for us is there's, uh, there's those three box sets. There's also From Darkness Comes, which is more of a more traditional horror box set, but Glenn James and I put that one together as well. So there's four total, and the back matter of each of those four boxes points to the other boxes. So every time mm -hmm. we published one, the other one's got, got a little bit of a lift. So I think that's probably keeping all the boxes collectively afloat longer than they may have been on their own. Party on, James. You bet, man. <laughs> All right, so you, you think we should move on to the topic? Yeah, yeah. I got a few things I wanted to say about tonight's topic. So. <laughs> oh, my God, there it is, the uh, old paper joke again. Uh, well, you know, I'm trying, to, I'm trying to get my money's worth out of this prop. So. Yeah, you know, for the people on, who are just listening, like on iTunes or just listening to the audio feed, you got to head over to YouTube and watch the video so you can, you know, really make his, his prop, you know, worth the time and energy he put into this joke. <laughs> Otherwise, you know, I'm sure he's going to be crying if he gets no views. Well, yeah, I mean, I, I did. <laughs> I, I really, really thought long and hard about that prop. And, and yeah, so it's I don't have any props. I feel like I'm I feel like less of a man. <laughs> That's true. I do got these cool sunglasses on. And the cool hat. Is the hat cool? It's it's wool, right? Is it like a wool hat? It's like I don't know. It's like this cool hat that just is like, it's a very like flexible. I I love it because it's just comfortable. See, I go from the hat to Nicholson's face, and so I just you know I'm going back and forth as I'm Scott looking at Nicholson. <laughs> yeah, that's who you have on your back wall, right? Scott Nicholson's face. Yeah, that's Scott Nicholson back there. Yeah. 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 He's uh, staring at Hitchcock. <laughs> All right, so let's get into the topic today. What do you think? Let's do it. I didn't forget anything else, did I? I don't know. You might want to use the prop again, but... No, nah, that's coming nah. out now. <laughs> uh, well, we, we were talking about uh, the topic is the, a good topic to reintroduce the podcast, and we said, uh, you know, writing process uh, might be a good place to start, and we could talk a little bit about... Uh, how we work and what our preferences are and uh, just as a sort of a, a lead-in I think one of the things I realized pretty early on is that there isn't any one particular way it's really what works for you but it helps to hear what other authors do because then I think you can try things and see if you can incorporate those into your own process so we're not necessarily sharing this saying like yeah this is the way you should be doing it it's just the way we do it so it's the way we do it yeah, it's, it's how we roll. <laughs> <laughs> do you want, to, you want to start or do you want me to start? Well, uh, yeah, you go ahead and start. Okay. Um, so, I'll, yeah, I, I guess I'll kind of talk you, a little bit. Yeah, maybe with start with, uh, like, uh, do, you, do you plot out your books, you know, kind of from the entry stage of uh, kind of thinking about the idea? Do you outline? Do you just sort of start someplace with kind of a maybe a scene in mind and then go yeah i i hate outlining and if i was forced to do it it would feel like work and i know i know i know there are a lot of writers and writer coaches that would probably just spill their drink or spit it out on their monitor or whatever but they're, I, they're doing it right now yeah i can see them uh I, I just find it incredibly boring. I, like I, if I had to sit down and write to an outline sort of knowing every small detail that was going to come up, I would be bored stiff. So I'm a pantser, although I will say uh, now where I am now, uh, I'll, I'll get about um, a third of a way in, and I start sort of mapping out my end game. It's not an mm -hmm. outline, but I, I kind of have a general sense in a real traditional three-act structure. When I'm in Act 1... I kind of know the the big thing that's going to happen in Act Two and Act Three, and and I write towards that, but I don't sit down with like you know Chapter One, Section One, Point A. Like I, 
I don't. Well, do I think that. You, I think you once you start writing, even if you just start with a scene, you know, you're going to get ideas for where it's going. Yeah. Along the way, and writing those ideas down, I don't think that's outlining per se. Because right. I do the same thing. I mean, you know, you'll be writing a scene and go, oh, I need to make sure that, that this happens later on. Yes. And maybe it's two characters and they're, they're in a discussion and you realize, oh, I got to come back to that discussion later. Mm-hmm. So you make a little note at the, I usually just kind of do it at the bottom of the file. Yeah. And I use, I use Word and a Scrivener is very like, you know, you got all these notes and little, maybe you can get into that. But, but I just, at Word, on Word, I just kind of, put it right down at the bottom. So it always sits at the bottom. And then when I hit something, I just delete it. Uh, when, once I reach that scene. Yeah. Yeah. I use a, I, I do a similar thing, whether it's in word or Scrivener, I use the brackets and I think, I think I kind of stole this from Hugh Howie, but I don't think he'll complain about it, but he, I, he used some character as well. And that way, whether you're in word or Scrivener or whatever, you can do a search for that character and it'll show you all the places in your document where you left yourself those notes. So, Rather than kind of step out of the flow, I'll just bracket a note, and then I know when I do a search later, I'll come back and find it and address it. Yeah, I don't do that because I don't want to, like, I'm very, like, um, I don't know what the word is, anal, I guess, <laughs> about, like, about the way everything looks. So when I'm writing, like, I, I self-edit as I write. So I don't want, like, misspelled words. I don't want little, like, you know, markings in there that aren't supposed to be in the final copy. What, so I just, what, I have like a section at the end. Yeah. yeah, I just, I'm very, what I know do you mean most. By self-edit? Like, how, what do you mean by like, self-edit while you write? You know, most, most authors I hear, they just, they tell you, well, you need to sit down and just fart it out really fast. Mm-hmm. You know, don't, don't worry about editing anything. Don't worry about correcting anything. You just want to get the story out. I think King actually in his book uh, on writing discusses it like, getting out like a fossil I believe that was the analogy he used uh where you're just you know trying to dig up the fossil and it it doesn't have to be perfect and shined up all polished up all nice but you're just trying to get it out and work it out and that's just never how I've how I've done it I've always like I write a page and I don't move on to the next page until that page is is perfect or at least as close to perfect as I can get it wow and so I'll yeah I'll re-edit sentences like over and over again, I'll move them up and down and try to find different places. Uh, I'll look at a paragraph and, and decide, oh, that should be two paragraphs. And then I'll make it two paragraphs and then I'll go, oh, maybe it should be one again. And then, I'll, you know, until it f- looks, it has to look right. It has to, to feel right. It has to sound right. Uh, I think I discussed this on, on the last show I was on when I was just a guest that I came from writing very like lyrical poetry. That's kind of where I started. And so to me, the way something sounds is really important. So when I read it back, those little pauses, like when you create a new paragraph, that it makes it sound differently when you're reading it. Oh, yeah. You know, that it's, it's supposed to be a pause there. And so I'm always thinking about that and kind of overthinking. I know everybody usually does that, but they wait till the end and then they go back through and do it. And I don't really see it as being making much of a difference because with me, I'm just doing like, the first, second, third, fourth draft all at once. Yeah. So I, so it takes me longer to get through the first draft, but when I'm done, it's basically done. Yeah. Like I don't have to really do anything because I make sure chapter to chapter that I'm following the story correctly. I really, the only editing I do once I'm done is just proofreading. It's just to make sure I didn't use the wrong there or something. Yeah. You know, and cause you know, you will miss a few of those things. Um, that's that's pretty much all I do. So it's kind of nice because once I'm out of a scene, and I've tried it the other way, like I'll write write something really fast and then go back. But I feel like once I'm out of that scene, it's hard for me to get back into it. So yes. I think that's why it, it's always helped me to to make sure I get everything you know in that scene out while I'm there. Because if I try to go back, it's just like I'm not in it anymore, and it's hard for me to write anything. I I totally get that. I I don't think I could. I don't think I could first draft that way, but I totally understand why you would. And, uh, and I think everything that you do, it takes me probably six to seven passes. And, uh, and I would say I think where, where we're probably similar is I totally agree that uh, not necessarily the, the scene, but the project. If I'm out of the project for too long, and by too long I mean like six to eight weeks, 
Like if I finish a draft and I, and I set it aside and I don't come back to it for eight weeks, I feel lost. And I, I feel like almost I'm starting from like before, I have to go like before zero to start. Like I almost have to read my own story before I can even start the next revision process. So I totally get why, why you're doing that. Like I, I don't think I could write that way because for me, I am one of those guys where I just kind of spit it out and, and I just go and I know I'm misspelling and I'm using the wrong words and, and I said I use a bracket when I know I got to come back and then like I'll do the whole draft that way uh, and, and then I have, I've really got to like move stuff around and, and all that in revisions so I can understand why you do that but uh, I would also imagine it probably takes you a long time. Yeah, I'm definitely that. not recommending it as, as the way to go. It's yeah. just the way I've always done it and and I've tried to do it the other way and or, or do this thing where people tell you to like to like set a timer and just try to write as fast as you can <laughs> in that hour and stuff. And it just it doesn't work for me. It actually kind of stresses me out. It makes me write even slower. <laughs> like when I feel like I'm writing to a timer. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I don't write I may write four or five hundred words an hour, but those are, are four or five hundred like ninety nine percent done words. Yep. So really it's probably not as bad as you would think mm -hmm. i mean if i wrote four or five hours a day i could do two thousand words a day and done. and it's done basically yeah. Yeah. so i actually write pretty clean copy and and i've always you know every every author i come across always says to do it the other way but one, one day and this was probably like a year or two ago i uh saw it i think it was on amazon it was like you know sometimes in in the author section the from the author section they'll yes. they'll put like an interview or something yeah and it was an interview with dean Kuntz, and he basically said i do the exact same thing uh, as as what i do and, I, and then i went to his website and he actually has a has a little thing maybe i'll read uh, like a little portion of it uh it's in his little freq frequently asked questions mm -hmm. and the question is I've read that you will re rewrite a page until it's right before moving on, sometimes redoing a draft 30 or 40 times. This must make for a slow process. Uh, and he says, he says the process is slow, but that's a good thing. Because I don't do a quick first draft and then revise it, I have plenty of time to let the subconscious work. Therefore, I am led to surprise after surprise that enriches the story and deepens character. I have a low boredom threshold, and in part, I suspect I fell into this method of working in order to keep myself mystified about the direction of the piece. And I thought, wow, that really like explained exactly how I feel. I think when I try to rush through it, I, I don't I don't think about it as much, and, and I end up end up not writing something as as good as I could have if I'd really like let my subconscious guide me a bit more. Yeah, yeah, and and like like like. A lot of people I know they forget things. Like I have a, I have a very good memory, so I won't forget where the story's going. Now I do think that there's a point where you gotta let you gotta move on. You can't just rewrite the same scene, you know, a hundred times and just go. Oh well, I've done that before with a previous book, my first novel, which I'm sure a lot of people did with their first books. You know, you kind of rewrite the thing to death, and even then, it's still not very good when you reread re it. You know, years later, but you, you got to move on at some point, but, but I feel like when I'm kind of thinking about things and allowing myself to, to kind of back away from the keyboard for a moment so I can really think, okay, what's going on here? What am I doing? That actually helps me write a better story than if I were just, oh, let me just try to get it all, all really fast, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And that make, it makes sense. Uh, I think like for me, my, I have a, I have a good memory, but it's in a different way. So I feel like I can I can kind of vomit that stuff out and I can do the whole first draft that way and I've got that all in my head. And so if I go back and do a revision, I remember all of that vomit <laughs> sprayed all mm -hmm. over the walls. But if I let that draft sit for six or eight weeks, then I completely lose it. So it it's like the ability to hold that in my memory is good, but it's only for like a certain amount of time. And so I have to go from like one revision right to the next. Like I just, I, I finished one day, the very next day I'm on, the, on to the next revision. I can't. I can't let it sit for too long. So I think we probably finish at the same place because I probably Hopefully, get, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, cause I think I get, I probably get maybe when I'm writing a first draft, I hit probably get two to 3000 words a day in. And then, uh, and so I can knock out the first draft of a, you know, a, 
a typical novel of mine in uh, a, little, a little over a month, and then I can take another couple weeks to go through revisions. Um, and I'll probably, if going at your pace, we probably end up at the same place at the same time. Yeah, I would just, just probably get less done every day, but I'd end at the same point. Yeah. yeah. Now, there was like one story that I've, it's still like 60,000 words in, and it's been there for, for years. It just I just haven't gotten around to finishing it. And it's one of those stories where it's it's a really kind of crazy story. Like there's so many mm-hmm. webs like interweaving like uh, different time periods where like a lot of the story takes place in present time and then it takes place in the 70s. And then there's, you know, there's all these different and, and, and just it's almost like a mystery the way it comes together. And that one, it started as this just really basic idea. And as it sat, though, I've really developed it into this really big idea. And I think if I had wrote it years ago and just pounded it out, it wouldn't have been, it won't end up as good as it will when I eventually finish it. Yeah. But, but I do think I've taken too long now. Like I, it's one of those I need to get back to because, because I'm kind of so far removed from it now. It's going to be a little weird trying to, it's going to take me a month or so just to kind of get the flow back. Yes. Yes, definitely. And so what, what's it look like then? What's the, the process look like when you send your, manuscript to your editor what do you mean like do you, <laughs> <laughs> do you i guess i should back up well you, you see i have a uh, a file and i email it to them through gmail and then oh, <laughs> oh good i yeah, thought you, you see were you, handwriting notes and walking there, it over to the there's post this office. little there's this little tab at the bottom that says you can attach a file and you see you hit that oh, and okay. then there's a send button and you want to make sure it's completed sending before you click off because you if to, you don't. you have to put a stamp on your screen when you do that? No, you actually, it's free. You don't have to buy stamps or anything. I know you're old school. You still send it through the snail mail. Yeah, yeah. I handwrite it and, and tape it to a pigeon. You got uh, that big stack of papers there. So. All right, so let me rephrase my question. If you're doing a lot of this sort of self-editing as you go along and you, you feel like it's really tight, when, when you get stuff back from your editor, is it more proofreading or is it more content editing? What's it look like? I've only recently like started to, to, to send stuff to editors. Um, my first few projects, like the first one I just, I just threw up just to test out this whole indie publishing thing. Yeah. And I mean, that book really wasn't all that great. It was just sort of a average, forget it kind of book, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I didn't want to put something new up, you know, and have this, this indie publishing thing be a total crock. And then it was like I wasted my, my opportunity to publish something that was good by self-publishing it. But, of course, that isn't the way it went. And, and I ended up pulling that book down. But, but yeah, I, I, I only recently started to, to look into to more professional editing. Um, but, but, but usually it's mostly just, like, like you said, kind of proofing. Mm-hmm. I don't really... I'm not big into content editing. I'm, I don't know if I'm a control freak, but I kind of <laughs> like to, to just have the story be my story. I don't send it off to a lot of beta readers because I feel like, well, you're going to get like a bunch of different ideas and everybody's going to sort of have a different opinion on it. And if you just try to write to what your beta readers want, I don't know, I'd almost rather just write what I, what I want to do and, and let, it, let it do what it does. If people like it, then great. If I fail, then at least I failed being who I was and not just trying to write to what other people want me to write, I guess. Yeah. Uh, so mostly it's, it's proofing, but it's only recently in the last year have I started doing that. Um, yeah. So it's, 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 it's a lot of just finding maybe there, you know, there's certain things you do where you might use the same phrase or you might, you know, use the same kind of punctuation wrong. And you just, it's one of those habits you got into where you do the, you do it wrong every time. Mm-hmm. And, I don't, I can't think of any off the top of my head, <laughs> but there was always like, every time I send one off to the, to the editor, it's always the same. It's always the same marks. You'd think I would write them down by now and just try to find them myself. But, but I don't get, I, I've never gotten a lot of, of people in my books. Uh, I mean, my, my reviews to my books commenting on, on the grammar or misspellings or, so I feel like at least I'm doing a, a pretty good job mostly by myself. Yeah. Uh, and I think you can, I think maybe, maybe because I have this sort of crazy self editing process that I'm able to find a lot of those things myself. I also go through and, and, and do my own, 
when, when I'm done with the book, I'll, I'll, I'll do like where I'll send it to my Kindle and then I'll read it on my Kindle. Yes. Because I find it's easier to read too. it on there than it is on the computer screen. Yep. It looks different too. You can yeah. Brain, yeah. You can notice things. things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I'll just make little notes. It's nice. You can just like press the screen and then put like a little note. Okay, I need to move this down or whatever. Right. And then I'll also, sometimes I'll use Dragon or, mm -hmm. or I've even done the old, I have like a Kindle, an old school like Kindle keyboard too. Yeah. That, that does like too. the voice thing. Yeah. <laughs> Reads it to you. I have the Kindle Fire and that one. Yeah, it'll read it to you. So I think that having it read to you is an easy way to spot like little things, you know. Right. So I go through this whole week-long process when I'm done where I, it's sort of like just a proofing process, really. I don't really do content editing because mm -hmm. unless there's something that I just happen to find, but usually I've already worked all that out in the writing process. So, yeah, I'll, I'll go through these different ways, you know, having it read out loud and, and read it on different devices and, and making sure, you know, read it really slowly and make sure I read every line and, so I, I haven't had a lot of people complain, and, and that's one of the things about self-publishing that gets a bad rap sometimes is that all the books are poorly edited or the author just, you know, spits something out really quick just to make a quick buck. And I really don't want people to look at my books like lump those, mine in with those books, so I, I, I make sure I do my due diligence. Yeah, yeah, I think you have to. I think we've both, you and I talked about that before, we've both pulled books down that were previously mm -hmm. published because didn't quite meet the standards I think we had in mind. Um, yeah, I, I guess I, I have a very different perspective on the editing process. I've always hired editors, but it wasn't until the past year where I found one that I thought was really, really good. Uh, not that the others weren't, but um, I, I can plug her, right? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I'm going to plug her. Uh, Rebecca T. Dixon is is my my primary editor, and she's a she's she's killer, man. She is tenacious, and she holds me accountable to things because I think um, I think my writing style and my brain probably works differently than yours. And I as, I've always assumed a lot, like, well, yeah, of course the reader would know that, and and they really don't. And so she's that voice in my head that that you have that I don't. That's saying like. Um, hey, what about this guy? He, you know, he said this, and now he's saying this, and uh, so it's not. I think what she provides for me is not necessarily content editing as far as the story. I think she's really good about leaving the story intact and not messing with like the vision, but just helping me with a lot of those logistics and scenery and uh, and consistency that can pull reader out of a story. Um, so I've I've found her work to be indispensable. I, you know, it, she's. Um, She's really made my writing better. It's, it's so much better that I had I paid her to go back and re-edit five books that were already published and professionally edited, hmm. and she caught a lot of stuff that that was still there. So. Soon you're just going to be paying her to write the books for you. <laughs> you know what? I'm uh, I'm going to make a note. Where's my paper? I got I got to ask her about that. I said, Will you just write the book for me? Well, you know, one of the things I think that has always stopped. A lot of a lot of self-published authors, when they, at least when they first start, it is usually the, just the cost. Right. So I don't know how Rebecca goes, but is uh, as you know what what is the general ballpark you you you're, you're paying for your editing? Yeah, you're going to spend a couple thousand dollars on a novel. Mm -hmm. Yeah, easy. Uh, the thing with Rebecca, though, um, that I, that I don't I don't even sort of blink at it anymore because I used to pay like a first read editor I used to pay and then like a proofreader and then uh, you know some some of the works I had I you know went through three or four different editors for different reasons and she does it all so basically when she's done uh, and I make my revisions I send it to my proofreader for just you know punctuation yeah uh, you know that that sort of stuff but uh, basically she handles it all and I don't have to hire any other editors so it is more expensive I think than what I was paying but in the long run um, she's totally worth it do you have any beta readers or you just skipped over that? Um, beta readers. You know what I have? I, I give advanced review copies out. Um, I've but never I don't... gotten one. Oh. I mean, well, we've been friends now for, for how many years? Since college and I <laughs> never heard about this. I mean, I never give out advanced review copies to anyone. Nobody at all. Nobody. Uh, okay. 
Uh, but beta, beta readers, uh, no, I don't. And I think I, I totally agree with you. I'm afraid with a beta reader, they, they mean well, but they're basically seeing the story from what they want. And, and then, so if you get six beta readers, then what do you do with the feedback? <laughs> well, I mean, the, the, part of the thing for me is, is I would send it to people, and they either wouldn't tell me anything useful, like, just, oh, it was good. Like, yeah. Well, thanks. I mean, I don't yeah. know. And I would try to pick their brain. And so they, they were just, lying to you pretty much? No, I, not that they were lying. I would just, I would try <laughs> to ask them. They thought it was good, they were lying. Well, maybe. <laughs> but I would, I would try to ask them questions, and, and they just didn't know how to, like, articulate what their thoughts on it were. So it was kind of like, well, what, what are you here for? I mean, it's, this isn't helping me. But plus, plus like, like you said, it's kind of, I don't know, it feels like, I don't want to have my story drawn a certain way. And I think with a beta reader, that's kind of the whole point is that you're like, hey, tell me what's wrong with it. And even if there's nothing wrong with it, they're going to feel compelled to say something. Yes. They're going to go, oh, well, maybe this scene was a little slow or maybe yes. the beginning could have been. And, and just because just they want to feel like they're helping. Right. And it's like maybe if they had just read it just as any other book, then they would have just said, oh, yeah, it was really good. I liked it. And they wouldn't have had all these little nitpicky things. But when you ask them to be nitpicky, well, then it's like, of course, they're going to come up with something. It's like having those writers. They, write... they, they want to feel useful. They want to yeah. feel like they're helping you. Yeah. It's like, if, if, like I've never been in a writer's group, but I know that's what they do. They sit around in a circle and they go and critique each other's stuff just for the point of trying to make themselves better. And that's fine. But at the same time, it's, it's really it's going to be whatever story your critique group wants and not the story that was in your head. Yeah, I've never been part of a critique group. I, I, I have no desire to be. I don't have anything against them, but I, I, I agree. I don't, I don't see anything valuable there because of the motivations of the people that are involved. And, and they all mean well, but you're right. It's like if you, know, you don't want to hurt someone's feelings, and at the same time you want to you wanna say something so you feel like you're contributing, even if you yeah. don't have to. And I think that's why I like the, the advanced review copy reader as a better idea because that's basically saying – like here's here's a little gift to you for supporting me. You're you're gonna get this ahead of time. I'm not expecting you to give me any feedback, but I've found with advanced review copies, uh, sometimes I will get some things that come back and I and they're pretty you know pretty significant. And I go, oh yeah, okay, you know like that's that I hadn't thought of that. But it's not mm -hmm. like something. It's not the same as asking for like what what should I change, uh, and I, you know I have. One guy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give him a shout-out because he's been with me since, from day one, Robert Pettigrew, who's a uh, great guy, and I, I get him all my advanced review copies. Whenever I ask if people want them, he always says yes. It's become um, my ideal reader now. Like He's almost a guy I know sort of what he likes, and I know the kind of stuff he reads, and so as I'm writing, I'm thinking about him. I'm thinking about like how he's going to be entertained by this and what's going to what, what he's going to find interesting. And I think that's a whole different thing than a beta reader. So he's the uh, middle-aged metalhead you were talking about on the last show? <laughs> As a matter you of fact. You said when you started that. Yeah, well, he yeah. is a middle-aged metalhead, and he's not the only one. But, like, I, I just, you know, I use him as an, as an example because he's, he's been with me so long, and he helped me form my little uh, keeper's club and everything. Uh, but, yeah, it's like, you know, you get the, that sort of reader archetype in your head, and especially early on before... I knew anything about my audience, he was definitely it, and he was the guy I was writing for. Not him exactly, but that kind of guy. Yeah, I think it also depends on the story you're writing. Uh, I know with my Dead Highway series, it's very uh, conversational. It's, it's written in first person. It's it kind of like, if there, if there is mistakes in there, I, I kind of almost don't care, just because I, it should feel natural like somebody's telling you something. Yeah. And when people speak, they don't speak in all complete sentences and everything like that. Right. So it, I almost wouldn't want somebody to, to, to start content editing that because it, it might ruin the voice of the narrator. And then voice sure. is what people love so much about that series. Yeah. It's the quirkiness of, of the, the main character. Um, but now that other book I was talking about, the one that I've been working on for years, mm -hmm. the one with all the, the you know, interweaving storylines, that's one that I know when I'm done, it's definitely going to like, Rebecca or somebody <laughs> right <laughs> and, and I'm probably going to have a bunch of beta readers for that one because it's one of those stories where if I don't do it right it won't make sense yeah and so it's almost like a mystery it has to make sense I have to layer it so I'm definitely going to have specific questions that I'm going to ask people when they're done with it hey did you figure this out when did you figure it out kind of stuff 
because otherwise I, it, it could end up being like the greatest book or it could end up being a you know total piece of trash if it doesn't make any sense and it, it's, it's a very kind of jumbled story and right now it's going all different directions so I, I need to bring it all together and I need to make sure it came all together and just just relying on me to do that isn't going to be enough for that story I th yeah I totally get that in fact that's it's kind of how I write a lot of my novels are like what you just described. They're kind yeah. of esoteric and different, and especially when you're writing them across multiple books, you you have to yeah you have to do that because there's so much to to remember and so much to to keep. And so from book one to book three of a of a trilogy, like you can't you can't mess that up. You've got to you got to keep that tight and you got to remember it. And um, and I I think that's probably very true for me because that's those are the types of stories I write more often than not and to my own detriment <laughs> <laughs> yeah how many series series do you have now i ha i have two different series that overlap and then i have a couple of standalones that could become a series but um i wrote them they're not my favorite stuff like th this is another weird thing I, it may be a tangent it might be part of process but i don't know about you but i'm just now like i'm after everything I've published and everything I'm, I've written, I'm just, I feel like I'm just now coming into my voice. Mm -hmm. and, I, and it's not that I'm embarrassed of the early stuff, but it's, it's definitely like me growing and me figuring it out. And, and, and they're good books, and I like them, and I'm glad people like them, but I feel like I'm just now sort of figuring it out from that standpoint. So I don't know if you feel any of that. Yeah, I think there's a lot of that, whether it's the, the writing, how to write, and what your voice is, you know, because at the beginning you always, it's just imitation, you know, you read Stephen King, and, oh, I want to write like Stephen King, so you try to write that way, and then maybe you read some other author, you know, H.P. Lovecraft, whoever, who writes kind of differently than Stephen King, and, oh, maybe I'll try to do that, you know, and, and you, you, you're always just imitating things, and that's how you learn, and eventually you, you, you find your own voice, it's somewhere in, in mixed in there, Right. And and you really, you try to fight it for so many years, because you think, oh, i got to write this certain way, for it to sound good for people to take me seriously but I've just sort of given up on that and I just like to to write you know fun stories that, that people can enjoy yeah I agree um, it takes a while to shrug off that lack of confidence yeah if, if for lack of a better term but this idea that like yeah you know what I don't care if you like it or not you being like the greater you like mm -hmm. I'm not writing to a mainstream audience I'm not writing to everyone and if there's a small group of people that are really into it and they dig it and they keep coming back then then that's who I'm writing towards I'm not I'm not going to be concerned about like winning a literary prize or anything like that yeah well they always say what do you need to just like 10,000 true fans or something I think it's less than that I think Is it's it? like a, a thousand yeah a thousand there, that, that was the that was the article not too long ago a couple of years ago I guess that came out it was that idea of a thousand true fans and if you have a thousand true fans you can sustain a, a living so I only arts. need like like another 990 or so. <laughs> That's what I was thinking, like good. another 980, I'll be right there. <laughs> oh, you got more than me then. You are a top 100 horror author. Yeah. Although I think, I'm in, I think I'm in the top 100 now because of the box set. I, I think you are. The box set you. like pulls me in. Yeah, you absolutely are. So, uh, But you know, like that's, see that's the kind of stuff like, it's sales based, you know? So people can say, oh, I don't like that or that's not, good literature or whatever but or you don't win this contest but I don't care about that stuff like I you know people people decide with their wallets that's mm -hmm. what it comes down to and if uh, if I feel like I can put a product there and people are willing to pay for it I feel extremely fortunate and that's gonna motivate me to keep doing it how do you feel about you know talking about sort of awards and stuff you're a member of the Horror Writers Association right yes how do you feel like they, I guess they just started letting self-published works in yeah, <laughs> you're. And you're there's like been the kind third, of a big hoopla about it. Yeah, you're the third guy that's that's phrased the question that way. It goes, so how do you feel about that? Yeah. <laughs> which, 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 what you're really asking me is, if you don't care about shit like that, why are you in the Horror Writers Association? So here, here's my answer, totally honest, right? Um, I I applaud that organization. They're not the first to do this to let indies in, but they're they're definitely at the leading edge of it. And I'm really proud to say that I got into that organization on my own terms. So I didn't get an agent. I didn't, I didn't get assigned to a, a publishing deal by one of the big five. I got in as a self-published author the day after the referendum passed. So 
I'm proud of that. And, um, you know, I've only been in it for four weeks or so, maybe a little longer than that. So I really don't know what role it's going to play in my career, in my, in my writing. But I've been a supporting member of the organization because I like to support horror. But I've been a, a supporting member for a few years. And as soon as they established those guidelines for indies, I was in. And, and I just feel good about the fact that that organization came to self-publishing and not the other way around. So what was it before you were like an affiliate or something? Yeah, they have like a it's a supporting membership, so anyone can yeah can be like I, a supporting member. I was I was in the horror association for maybe a, a year or two, but it was like it had to be like ten years ago. Oh, okay. And I didn't really have anything, you know. I had like a few short stories or something, but it wasn't enough to to be like an active member. Right. So I don't know if it was called an affiliate or whatever, but I paid the dues. Yeah. Um, and so, so recently when I seen a lot of authors kind of, kind of going crazy, oh yeah, I'm so excited. I'm in the horror writers association. I guess my thought was like, I don't know. I have no, no real interest just because I don't know what they're really going to be able to offer me at this point. Yeah. Like before it was, you know, the whole thing was based around traditional publishing right. and it was, it was now I just, I, I just don't know what what good is it? Is it, just, is it just so I can feel excited like oh I'm, I'm part of this association I feel like it seems to me like a lot of indie authors are just oh well now I'm accepted and it's like almost kind of sad it's like you know you should have felt accepted before like yeah like you should never feel felt bad about about doing this and, yeah. and now they're like they're jumping up and down like oh I'm so excited because they're allowing me in this now I can call myself a real author it's like you were an author before and I almost feel like like I don't almost don't want to join for that reason <laughs> No, I don't, I don't feel any need to validate what I do through any organization or agent or publisher. Uh, and and, and like, in fact, I have a number of friends who are, you know, have an agent and they ha they're signed to like small, uh, they're not vanity publishers, they're just smaller publishers. And those publishers take like, they, they take 40% of the royalties after Amazon takes its 30%. And I'm like, why are you, you know, why are you doing that? What, what are they doing for you that you can't do on your own? And really what it comes down to for it's just the validation, them, yeah. it's the validation. And it, and it's usually coming from like friends and family or, or people that don't know the industry and, and who still you know, look down their nose at self publishing. But the truth is like when people buy a book they're they don't care who the publisher is. They don't care who rep, who rep that author. They don't care what organization that author is part of. None of that matters. So I think if you keep all of that stuff in perspective, then it's okay. You know, like I, I didn't start writing to get into the HWA. That, that wasn't, you know, I w that wasn't my plan. I wasn't like, wow, well, someday I'm going to be a writer when I get accepted into the Horror Writers Association. I did what I was doing, and then they, they said, well, we'll t we'd welcome you based on what you've done. So, you know, what that's going to mean for me in the future, I have no idea. Uh, it might not mean anything. But... Um, I guess, you know, I, I feel totally, f I, I understand what you're saying, but for me, it wasn't something like I was pining to do. It wasn't something I felt like, oh, I'm going to be a real writer once I get in there. No, and I'm not saying that you were there, but the, this author that I had come across, he, he was just jumping for joy about it. Like, it was so, it was just, it was it did seem like it was kind of sad. Like, he was just, oh, well, finally, you know, I'm, I'm my, my writing is for real now, you know, and it was like, yeah, I, I didn't understand that, you know. Well, even before they let in self-publishers, the terms weren't really about writing. Uh, I mean, you had to get like a certain certain amount on an advance. Yeah, well, that like two thousand in royalties or something. Yeah, well, I mean, that's yeah, that's, that's the new benchmark for self publishers. So now it's you have to make two thousand dollars in royalties on a single title within the tw first twenty four months of its release. That's that's the criteria for self publishers. But Which before, is really easy for most yeah, people. Yeah, it's, it's not that hard. It's it's not. I mean, if you're if you're writing, you know, career minded, you can do that. But before that, it had something to do with you know your first purchase piece and what your advance was, and you know, I don't know. It, it seemed like y your qualifications were more based on the quality of your agent than it was on your writing. Mm -hmm. that's yeah, I mean, favorite. that's how the whole the whole system was sort of built that way. You know, it was built on like all these validation sort of processes you had to go through you know, to really be considered a published author. And I kind of just forgot about them for, for, for the last 10 years. And then I only just recently, you know, came, came to think about them again is when I saw these people, you know, talking about how indies were now allowed in there. And yeah, I was just 
I don't know. I mean, I might change my mind. It depends on, on, on what they do. You know, it, can they offer me anything? I mean, is there anything there? Cause, cause I mean, I know it's a community and stuff, but I mean, I already know a ton of authors yeah. and I mean, through this show, we'll meet a lot of authors. So we don't need to have an association to have a community. We can create that ourselves. So, right. I mean, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I don't know either. I, I, I haven't, I'll watch you and see what happens, I guess. Yeah, I'll, I'll kind of tell you what's, what's worth the. You can not, keep but, me posted. Yeah, I haven't, I haven't really gotten into the organization deeply yet. You know, like, I'm not a convention guy. I'm not going to go selling books out of the trunk of my car, so I'm not really concerned about conventions. I what mean, if I'm they a, gave I'm you an award? award? What if they said, oh, you're getting the Bram Stoker this year? <laughs> award this year. Would you go to the uh, ceremony and accept it? Of course. But you just said you didn't care about awards, James. I don't. But I'm not going to. I don't. I don't. There's a, there's a difference between <laughs> not caring about an award and sort of actively. You would be giddy it. like a schoolgirl. I would you accept would, it. You would have the oh, award you're, like. You're telling me you wouldn't. It, your award would be like <laughs> hanging on the wall behind you, like so at every podcast people could see it. <laughs> I could see it, and you would just stare at me and like make me feel bad. That's, I would be crying, but you wouldn't be able to tell because I so got these they, glasses on. They engraved Richard Brown on a Bram Stoker. You'd be like, yeah. I don't know, Bram Stoker, he's so old now, you know. <laughs> Maybe if it was a Stephen King award or or something. <laughs> All right. I, 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 I mean, what did Bram know. Stoker do other than Dracula? Yeah, well, but he's got the coolest name in the history of writing. That is horror. a great I mean, name, yeah. Seriously, that is a That is an name. awesome name. I feel like we've kind of veered off of our uh, our topic of process, and we're kind of coming up on an hour. Or so, uh, you you want to you want to throw out some some closing thoughts or ideas about this first newly branded episode? Uh, I think it went horrible. Is is my initial opinion. I don't know what you're thinking, but what well, is a horror? We might just have podcast. to. Yeah. It just. <laughs> so we might have to just scrap this one and redo it again. I don't know what you're thinking. I was thinking, like, this is the best podcast I've ever, ever heard in the history of podcasts. It That's has the best thinking. opening, that's for sure. I, we could just go opening to close. Like, we could just and, do that. And whoever did the, uh, the voiceovers on that opening and the outro that you'll hear soon, they just did a fantastic <laughs> job. He's, he's very lively. I think exciting. it was the treehouse, wasn't it, from The Simpsons? It was the, it was the, uh, the haunted or, house from, I think, the season two. Yeah. House of Horrors, where yeah. they uh, have to stay in the in the house. We, I couldn't believe you got that guy because I, I called up the house. It's not mm -hmm. a guy; it's a house. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. and he, the house was like, "Yeah, I'll do that." That's incredible. Yeah, and I you had didn't to go through the house's agent, but yeah. I got oh, him. what did you have to? Did you have to trade any your awards to to get him to do that? <laughs> I had to get him a partial <laughs> membership into the HWA. You had to give him it. your Bram Stoker award before you <laughs> before they would agree to do it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, but no, seriously, I think it was—you know—it's a good show, and hopefully, we could put on a fun, entertaining, and, and, and informative show for everybody listening. Yeah, absolutely. I think we were talking—you uh, know—before we started the, this episode uh, offline and stuff. We said we really were going for sort of more of a talk show format, so we're going to have kind of some a Wayne's World on. And uh, <laughs> what's that? Wayne's World. Wayne's World, right? Yeah. And party Wayne's on, World. James. Yeah. Uh, um, I guess we could say we got Scott Nicholson lined up. He's going to come on as our first guest. Uh, it'll probably be a few weeks before we get that mm -hmm. uh, recorded and up, but he's going to be our first guest. So we'll occasionally have people joining us. And, uh, yeah, we're going to try and make it entertaining and fun and maybe even sometimes informative. Sometimes. Sometimes. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, you know, if anybody wants to, to like the show, and we've got a, a Facebook page now. I think there's maybe a couple likes on there right now. So, so uh, you know, we got a we got a Facebook page, we got a Twitter. Uh, on Twitter, I think it's Horror W Podcast because Horror Writers Podcast was just too long. Yeah. You know, you have to have I don't know how many letters it is, but but and, and Horror Podcast was already taken. So the name is 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 the Horror Writers Podcast, but the actual Twitter handle is Horror and a W Podcast. Yeah, and you can hit horrorwriterspodcast.com, and that will, all the social media links are there. And we really need you to like and review us because we need validated. Um, yeah, we need to be validated, I We think. need to be validated. We're not going to feel like um, a success until you tell us you like us. Otherwise, we're just failures. Yes, to please, to please like us. What we're doing. Also, if you have any questions or comments, uh, you can email the show. at the, It's the horrorwriterspodcast at gmail.com. 
Uh, anything, any, any, you know, if you think we suck, you know, you can tell us how much we suck. If you think we're great, you can tell us how much, you know, how great we are. Uh, and if you're if you're an author and and you think you got something interesting to talk about, hey, send us a note. Maybe we can get you on the show sometime. Yeah, you um, as long as you got a pair of sunglasses, you can get. On yeah, the show, you definitely right? got to have sunglasses. I don't know why you didn't wear yours. I'm disappointed. <laughs> well, I just like seeing me in the reflection of yours. So. Uh, that, well, I got to make sure I enough. I got to make sure I have my head tilted the right way. Then. <laughs> we don't want to see what's on your screen. No. No, you don't. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for joining us, everyone. Uh, we're going to try and do this every Monday. Uh, so when, whenever this one airs, um, a week after it, you can expect the next one. And as Richard said, if you get some show ideas or guest ideas or any of that, um, there's multiple ways to hit us up. We'd love to hear from you. Yeah, man. It's been fun. We'll see All you guys right. next time. See ya. Thanks for tuning in to the Horror Writers Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss an episode. Do it. Do it now. What are you waiting for? Like us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter. 